Okay, welcome to a tutorial on how to create uh, a film look from DSLR footage. We're going to be uh, creating something that looks like it was shot on film from this. This is what our rushes look like. The first step of the tutorial takes place in uh, my editing software because it has a particular colour correction tool. Here's some footage I shot just one afternoon in Farnborough. Um, you can see I tried to go after some lens flare for certain things, did some close-ups, did some wide shots, did some slow motion, really just tried to vary it a little bit. Our secret weapon in the fight against uh, the DSLR look is going to be this footage which is actually from the rushes of my graduation film Long Delayed Echo which I shot, what, four years ago now on Super 16mm. Now we had the rushes telecined at DNxHD 185, a very high bitrate format, and uh, this gives me an excellent reference as to the colour of film and the contrast of it and just kind of grain and hair and, and flicker and all, all the nice characteristics that we associate with the film look. So we're going to be concentrating first of all on the colour correction. Now all of our stuff is shot outside and I do actually have some rushes that were shot outside on Long, Long Lead Echo. This is not the whole film by the way, this is literally just a few clips that I picked up shortly before I left uni. So I, I don't actually have a colour board unfortunately but I'm going to be using this shot of a clapper board against some cliffs as a reference for the colour um, in, our, in our shots. So the first thing I'm going to do is come over to our footage. Uh, don't worry about this, um, uh, this second layer here that I've put in, that's, that's what our footage will end up looking like. I'm, I'm interested in this particular clip down here. We're going to be focusing on a couple of shots. Uh, I'm going to call this the, the landscape shot. I want to show you also about this shot, how this was done. This is the shot of the flies in slow motion. And also I'd quite like to, uh, probably good to do this shot as well, which I guess we'll call the, the puddle shot or the cyclist shot. Uh, it's all going to follow the same basic format. So with the landscape shot, the first thing I'm going to do is drop in a colour corrector. A lot of different editing packages have this three wheel system. It's uh, pretty standard across, uh, across the industry. But um, I'm particularly interested in it for these pipette tools. These are used for balancing out certain colours. So if you've shot in the wrong white balance, for instance, and uh, I mean, let's say, for instance, I don't know, you want the, the sky is supposed to be white. But for some reason, the white balance is wrong and it's looking blue when it shouldn't do. So you might take the minus pipette tool, click on your sky, and you can see it's corrected it out and made things go very orange. What it's actually done is it's added in a complementary colour into that particular range of values to try and balance it out. We don't want to do that. Uh, we want to do the opposite. We actually want to add in colours from a, from a separate shot. So with our shot selected and uh, our uh, video event effects window open, uh, we're actually going to go back over to our shot of the clapperboard this is what we're going to be using as our colour reference and we're going to select different values from this shot um, as, a, as a reference for the colour of the landscape shot. So let's just, yeah, that, that may not make sense but you, you'll see once we get on. So the first thing I'm going to want to do is select the uh, plus pipette, the uh, choose adjustment colour tool for the low ranges, so this will be what we would call the shadows. So I'm going to pick something on here that's dark, so the shadow between the two sticks on the clapperboard seems like a pretty good representation of what a dark colour is, what black is. So let's just do that. And then I'm going to pick a mid-tone, which I guess will be the perspex of the board. And then I'm going to pick a highlight, which uh, I don't actually have a highlight, there is nothing in this shot that's particularly bright, so I'm just going to pick the uh, camera tape that's down here because I don't want uh, blue highlights. Okay, so that's now been done. And if I just go back over to our landscape shot, you will see that what we have gone from is this to this. So we've corrected out some of the red. We've added in a bit of green as well. And uh, this is now looking a little bit better. The thing I don't like about DSLR footage is uh, it's often quite contrasty depending on how you shoot. What I'm going to actually going to do is uh, drop the gain down slightly, so that darkens the shot a little bit, and then I'm going to boost the gamma. So effectively that flattens out the shot a little bit, so I'll show you before and after, and you can see we've lost some of the contrast. Now we will get some of that back when we add in the film grain, but for now uh, it just makes it look as if the film has got more dynamic range. We've now colour corrected our first shot. I'm just going to quickly go through and colour correct our others. So the one with the flies, same thing again. 
color corrector and I'm going to go back over to our board and I'm going to select the shadow between the sticks, the perspex and the camera tape and where's that fly shop gone? It's over here. The, the trouble with this method unfortunately is that uh, you're introducing a lot of green and blue into the shot and that means you're losing a lot of orange and I know for a fact that orange does actually pick up really well on film as evidenced by this amazing sunset that we caught on Longglade Echo. So what I actually want to do is add back in some of that orange. So um, I will just colour correct our puddle shot to show you why that's necessary. Um, and how we can achieve that. So again, color corrector. Go back over to our board. By the way, a still of this board will be included with the uh, tutorial pack that you'll be able to download with this. And then I will just take out some of the contrast again. So again, th this is a really good shot to show you what happens when you um, when you drop the gamma suddenly the whole brightness of the shot goes but you then boost your gain to bring bring some of it back so what that does is flatten out some of the contrast quite a lot actually don't worry that the actual uh, the middle of the Sun which would normally be blown out is not blown out because by the time we finish with the shot it will be so we've color corrected that shot now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a secondary color corrector Secondary color correctors allow you to select particular colors to do. So if we were doing a little uh, homage to Schindler's List here, maybe we'd select, I don't know, the, the color of the cyclist's jacket and uh, just have that in color and everything else in black and white. What we're actually going to do is select the orange or the, well, the sky colors because we want some of that back. Uh, we want to get some of the orange back into the shot. We don't want it to be completely corrected out. So I'm going to show mask and this will allow us to see what color ranges we're dealing with. We just clicked the pipette tool there and selected a color and now we can choose uh, how wide we cast our net. So uh, I'm going to start by smoothing out some of the luminance values. This will allow us to have both a very bright color and also if we just go back kind of a slightly darker shades as well. We'll smooth out the saturation so that we can have uh, both a very intense orange and a not so intense orange. And I think I will just increase the high up a little bit. And then in terms of the, the hue, that, so that will allow us to get some of the reds as well as some of the yellows as well. So we're going to end up with quite a broad spectrum of colors that we can uh, grab onto. What we're effectively doing here is creating an alpha channel. So uh, the white is where the color correction that we're going to apply will be applied the most and the black it won't be applied at all and everything that's gray will kind of be it'll be applied but not as strongly so just to uncheck this show mask checkbox I can show you what that means if I slam everything up into the reds you can see that uh, where our mask was white uh, the sky has been changed completely to red and where it was more sort of gray kind of in these areas over here it's changed a little bit to red but not massively we don't want it to be changed to red we want it to be changed to orange so I'm just gonna pick a particular shade out that I quite like the look of and uh, so that is a before and that is after so we've added back in some of the orange there I might tweak that a little bit in actual fact I've actually got a preset which I uh, created for this so that uh, yeah that's what I am using for all of these shots I call it orange highlights unfortunately I don't think I can include that with the uh, tutorial but um, now you've seen how I made it so I will just add back in that preset so again to show you the mask I selected an area of orange played around with the values a little bit until I got something that I quite liked and then color corrected it and added in a bit more kind of orange to bring that back in and the same with the landscape shot actually probably has the least effect on the landscape shot because it's just dealing with the grass but uh, you do notice it slightly if I just check it on and off you can see that it goes from kind of quite desaturated to a little bit orange and that is everything you need to do 
to color correct these shots to begin with. So you're now ready to export. Once you've done the entire sequence, um, you can export it. I'm going to export it as an image sequence because that will give me the highest quality. I'll export it as a TIFF image sequence. I'm not going to go through how to do that because it will vary from software to software. And the next step of the tutorial is going to be over in After Effects, which is where we're going to head over to now. Okay, here we are in After Effects and uh, as you can see, this is the project that I was working on for this film look. Uh, and what I've got is my image sequence here. This is our um, color corrected footage, but it doesn't have anything else applied to it. So as you can see, I've gone through every shot and I've done the color correction that we spoke of and added the oranges back in and everything. Um, but there's nothing on there that particularly makes it look like it was shot on film. There's no grain, there's no flicker, there's no hair, there's no what I would call wiggle. So what we're going to do is um, add these effects back in. Now, if you're working in uh, Premiere, there's probably a dynamic link thing that you can do where you can open up the whole project as, as separate shots. I didn't have that option available to me. That's why I did it as an image sequence. So uh, what I've actually done is I've imported the image sequence in and then I've gone through and broken it up into separate shots. So that's literally just a case of importing the whole image sequence in into its own composition getting to the, the frame where it splits, where it cuts from one shot to the next, and doing Control shift d to break it into two shots. And I did that for every single shot in this sequence. I think there's about 20 of them, I think. Um, and that's what's given us this. Uh, the reason why I wanted to do that was because I wanted to work on each shot individually. It gives me a little bit more control. And as you know, we're focusing on three shots, the first of which is going to be our landscape shot. So. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is select that particular layer and I'm going to come over to layer pre-compose. Move all attributes to a new composition and I'm going to call it um, 04 landscape because it's the fourth shot in sequence and I've nicknamed it landscape. And to make things tidy I think I'm also just going to trim the edges of this out a little bit because I don't want the, the whole layer to be a comp, I just want that shot. So I'm just going to come over and trim those edges out a little bit. Okay, so let's open up our composition. So all we've got at the moment in there is our original shot. And what we want to do is add some grain to it. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, select some film grain. This is actually some 35 millimeter film grain that I got from uh, Vision Color, their organic um, texture pack. And I can scale it down. I think it's 80% uh, because it's in a 2K format. That brings it down to HD. And I will just again trim that so that it doesn't um, hang out over the edges of our clip. Now most tutorials that you watch online will say that um, the next thing you need to do is change the transfer mode to overlay and you're pretty much ready to go. They'll just um, and, and it's good because you can do that in pretty much any editing software these days. But I don't think that gives you the most realistic results because that's not the way film grain works. Um, the amount of grain you get in an image is dependent on the actual luminance of that particular part of the image. And I can prove this because during the filming of Long Blade Echo, I messed up and I did this shot, which was massively overexposed. And I've got two stills here on top of each other. They're sequential, so literally from one frame to the next, you should be able to judge the difference in uh, grain. Let's come and take a look at the highlights this particular bit of rock over here is massively overblown and if I'm switching from one frame to the next there's literally no perceptible difference in the amount of grain um, from one shot to the next. If you look at the mid-tones, so just kind of these areas that aren't 100% overexposed, you can see a little bit of difference, you can see a little bit of grain there. And if you go to the shadows, I know this isn't even that dark because as I said I overexposed the shot unfortunately you can see a lot more difference. Now some of this is going to be digital noise, but that is attempting to cope with the grain. And I can prove this even more by going into a shot which has both light and dark. So this is the famous flare sequence from that film. And uh, you can see the flare itself, there's literally no change in grain from one shot to the next. But if you look at the shadows in the kind of darker areas, there's a lot of noise, uh, a lot of grain going on there. So what we're going to do is attempt to replicate this. So what we're looking for is a way that we can get there to be more grain in the shadows than there is in the highlights. 
So the way we're going to do this is we are first going to duplicate our original layer and drag it above our film grain. And then I'm going to go and tint it to turn it black and white. And we're basically going to make a Luma matte. So I'm going to add in a contrast filter and I'm going to increase the contrast quite a bit and drop the brightness down as well because uh, I want there to be a lot of grain down here on the ground and I want there to be not so much grain up in the sky. And then we're going to choose in the track map for our grain, Luma inverted matte. So what that's basically saying is that everywhere that is dark in the image is where that grain is going to be most opaque and everywhere that's light in the image is going to be where it's most transparent. Um, I don't know if I can show you what that looks like. Can I drop that in somehow? So yeah, if you just take a look at the, um, the film grain layer on its own, it's still using that uh, Luma mat that we created. You can see that it's practically transparent where the sky is, but as we get further down and we get into uh, the kind of foliage down here, there's a lot more grain, which is more lifelike. It is more like what you would see in, in real life. So that is uh, my technique for adding grain. I think that's much more realistic than the other methods out there. And the good thing is you can actually control it. So you can go, well, you know what? Actually, I, I wish there was a bit more grain in the sky. I kind of, you know, I want to trick the audience into thinking that I shot this on a, on a different stock or whatever. And so you can change the Luma mat. You can make it more contrasty or less contrasty. So you do have that flexibility to be able to do that, which is quite good. Back over in our main comp, uh, it's time to add the, what I call the wiggle. So let's just open up the editing software for a second. I just want to show you a little shot here. So here's a shot of one of our characters coming over the top of a cliff. We had quite a nice way of tricking this, where he was on like a little ledge. He's not actually coming over a cliff. I don't think that's playing at 100% speed. This was a static shot. It was locked off on a tripod, but what can you see? well, the shot is kind of shaking around a bit, it's wiggling. And this is an inherent quality in film, it's less noticeable on 35mm, but on 16mm, perhaps maybe it's just because our uni cameras were a bit old, you do get this little bit of wiggle, um, and I think that that's quite an important characteristic, and I wanted to add that back in. So, I imported this long blade echo footage of uh, Reg coming over the cliff, and then I selected an area of high contrast, which in this case was the shadow between these two stones. And then I motion tracked it. So that's just a simple case of selecting your clip, clicking motion track, dragging your track marker to your area of high contrast. Not really interested in rotation. I just really want position, so that's fine. And then analyzing forward. And once I had an entire clip's worth of keyframes, I then added that to a null object, which is what we have here. And as you can see, when I drop it down, we have 20 seconds worth of um, shake basically. So I can uh, show you that that null object is parented to that area of high contrast. I can then copy that null object and I can go back into our main comp and paste it in and uh, I think once again I'm just gonna shorten it down and then you can parent your uh, pre-comped landscape shot to the null object and it too will wiggle around a little bit. Now because it's wiggling around you might see the edges of your frame come in so I'd also increase the scale by 1%. Um, the null object I think I'm going to include in with the rest of the material for this tutorial so you shouldn't have to worry about that too much. Every single shot in this sequence is handheld so you don't notice the wiggle very much but on a static shot you do notice it and I think it adds to it. Other effects you might want to add in are things like film burns. So uh, the, the burns I actually got also from the uh, vid color pack. Um, I'm quite interested in uh, burn number two. So um, yeah, this is really good for the transition between one shot and the next. And I know for a fact that I want the second half of this shot. So I'm just going to um, select uh, an in point halfway through. And then you can see the red and the yellow comes in and it pretty much goes all the way to the end. I'm then going to do an overlay edit and drop it into our comp and drag it down so it's on top of uh, shot four and shot five that it will be transitioning between. I also know that uh, I'm going to want to set it to add. That's going to mean the reds kind of just start to fade in over our footage, give it a nice organic looking burn. 
Oh, it's also too big, so I need to drop the scale back to 80%. Add a brightness contrast filter, increase the contrast a little bit, because I know that the black at the beginning is not actually black. And so that gives us a nice realistic burn where it, yeah, it just gets brighter and brighter and there's a nice, uh, I think I might need to move the placement around a little bit to get it just right. I really want the entire frame to be obscured by a really bright part of that burn. And then I think uh, because it's bright all the way until the end, I think what I'm actually going to do is just keyframe the opacity so it fades out. So that should give us... Yeah, a nice smooth transition from one to the next, which I think looks pretty cool. Yeah, that's nice. So another thing you might want to add in is dirt. So the uh, the dirt I actually picked up from Gorilla Grain, part of their free pack. Uh, they have this um, this clip, which is actually 720p. It's not um, yeah, it's not full HD unfortunately, but um, if you have a full HD version, I'm sure it will work much better. I'm going to drag this out into our um, main comp for shot 4 and again just shorten it down and this works in exactly the same way as uh, the film grain does I'm going to set it to overlay Whoops. so I'm just going to increase the scale up to 150 I'd say that's actually probably a little bit bright I'm wondering if perhaps I can um, you know what I'm actually going to do, I think um, all I'm really interested in here is the actual dirt. So I think what I might do is um, I might actually just key out the dirt. So if I do a quick Luma key on this, let's just solo this layer. I'm going to try and find a shot with a, a bit of dirt in it, like ah, like that. That's what I'm looking for, this particular speck of dirt and I suppose I could key out darker or I could key out brighter. Yeah, increase the threshold and I will feather it by one pixel. I say 0.5 of a pixel actually. So this means that it will only give us the uh, the dirt in the shot, it will only give us the hair, it won't give us any of the flicker. So all it's done is add in that slight bit of dirt there, which is nothing major, but it just adds a little something to the shot. It's particularly useful in areas where there's uh, brightness. So on that puddle shot, for instance, it's going to come in really handy for that. So I'm just going to show you the uh, finished comp that I made. Um, I'm going to show you the bug shot because there's some interesting stuff going on in that. For this particular shot, I added in a, a light leak, so um, that would be, uh, for me, I'm using it almost as like a type of flare. So I got those from Vegasaur. So if I just open up shot 13 to show you what I did, um, I actually imported, I, I did what we did before, made a pre-comp and uh, did the film grain, but then I thought, you know what, I'm going to add in a light leak and... The thing is the light leak will, will add additional brightness to your shot so I wanted that to be reflected in the luma mat of the grain so I ended up pre-comping again and uh, adding in the light leak on top so as I say the original footage looks like this the light leak from Vegasaur just literally goes in over the top I used a screen transfer mode and I, I, did I add anything else any kind of color correction no it just went straight in as it was and uh, that gives us the impression that there's a bit more flare kind of bouncing around. I think that's a very pleasing uh, look because you've got to remember tied to the film look is the look of the lenses of the time which weren't coated as well and they're often a bit blurrier. Um, so also there's another interesting trick as well that you can try. This, this is actually going to come out better on the landscape shot, something I forgot. Uh, I like to add in a lens blur. You could add in any sort of blur if you really want to, but I prefer a lens blur. I think it looks uh, nicer, more organic. Um, so let me just zoom in on that tree to show you what that's done. We've gone from quite a sharp tree to a slightly softer tree. And I'm just going to repeat edge pixels as well. That's very important, otherwise you will end up with a one pixel frame around everything at the edge. This is to simulate that the lenses weren't optically as good as, uh, as they are now. 
I mean, DSLRs, they, some of them post sharpen footage and some of them don't, but um, I just think it's a good characteristic to have. And that's pretty much it. So it's a combination of uh, light leaks, burns, grain, and that wiggle as well, which I do think is really important. There's just something about it. It just adds a little extra something. There's a couple of other bits in there as well. Like I think I did a few speed adjustments on a couple of the shots as well. Um, and a few kind of bright flashes, I think, um, for the dog shots in particular. Um, at the very end of one of those uh, dog shots, I added in a little flash. I'll just see if I can um, show you that. All that literally is, is uh, it's an exposure uh, adjustment, I believe. I think I did it inside the comp. Let's just take a look. Yeah, it's, a, it's an exposure. And also there's a slight blur in there as well, because I noticed that between shots um, on the long led echo footage, the last frame or the last two frames are always a bit blurred because um, it's the camera mechanism slowing down. So if you're looking to add in that nice that nice transition between one shot and the next, so it gets yeah brighter and there's just the, the hint of blur. It's, it's almost nothing. You can barely even tell it's there, but it is there. It's just yeah very not noticeable. And that is pretty much it. Once again, you're going to want to export it as uh, an image sequence or perhaps a QuickTime file, although I find that QuickTime files do tend to add in a bit of contrast and, and a bit of green as well for some reason. And then you can import that back into your editing software, as I have done, and sync it up with your footage. If you've done any speed adjustments, then uh, you'll need to kind of adjust a little bit to make that work. And uh, as you can see from some of these shots, you can see what we've gone to and from. So uh, image in the bottom left is what we started with. Top right is what we ended up with. And yeah, so it looks pretty cool. And I will now play this kind of comparison to play us out. So anyway, I hope that's given you some interesting new techniques. It's just my personal method of doing it. I hope you enjoyed the tutorial. And uh, yeah, subscribe for, for more, for whatever else I do next. Okay, cheers. Thank you. Bye.